Why does the devil keep messing with me? Why does he keep coming back in my life? You got something that belongs to him. And so we give him legal right to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, and he brings more of his friends, keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back because there's something of his that you have. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Let's give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> Whoo. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made, and in it we will rejoice and be glad. Amen. I am so excited to be here with you today. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else other than in the house of God sharing his rich word. Amen. Well, today we're going to go into a part number three of the series entitled Fake Church. You don't want to be a part of the fake church. We've been examining what a fake church is so that we will know uh, or have a better clue, better picture of what the real is. And in this series, the Lord is he's giving us definition. He's giving us wisdom. He's giving us understanding. Because in it all, he wants you to know that you are supernatural beings. And he is setting you up for blessings and for giftings and for anointings. Uh, he's setting you up to receive your inheritance now in this time. Surely you'll be blessed in the by and by in the heavenlies, but the Lord wants you to be able to thrive and to live right here and right now. You must be more than a conqueror right here and right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, one of the things that we find out also in Scripture that the Lord Jesus did battle, he battled against the false church, the fake church, with the scribes and the Pharisees constantly coming at him, constantly coming at them. He told the people, hey, he said, you listen to what they say because they're teaching Moses' law, but don't do what they do. Fake church. He called them hypocrites. John called them vipers. He called them snakes. He said, you guys, are, you're like whitewashed tombs or sepulchers. You look clean and white on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Fake church. So in that, we've been looking, we started looking at, we're going to go back there again. Let's look again at um, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, 2 Timothy 3. And let's go ahead and just do a little bit of reading here. Uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. And verse number one says this. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will, cons they will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Verse 5, we really were looking at that, right? Verse 5 says, they will act religious. King James said they will have a form of godliness. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And we've said that the power that they're rejecting really is the influence of the Holy Spirit. And a part of the influence of the Holy Spirit is uh, God's gift that he gives to us to repent. To repent. And repentance is not a bad word. We said that before. Repentance simply means to change your mind, to change directions. Now, there's a very uh, famous person in the Bible. Some of you may know his name. I'm not going to call his name just yet, but very famous person in the Bible who was recorded multiple times of him repenting. Multiple times repented. You know, he repented when he was going to destroy Israel. You may know his name. Uh, he, he repented when he, when he made man in the first place. You may know his name. You know, God repented multiple times. He changed his mind. Repentance is a gift that he gives to us. 
because he sees a path of, of destruction. He, he sees where this situation is going, and then he says, I'm giving you this gift. You can change. You can turn. It's a gift. So let's use it wisely. Repentance should be used daily, daily turning, daily turning unto God. Because remember, we're born into this world system, and this whole world system is trying its best to push you back into darkness. So and there are thoughts and concepts that we have received that we need to be changed. We need to turn. We need to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of this world. So God says, I'm about to place something supernatural into your hands. And I need you to hear this. The Lord's about to break the, or use the law of multiplication among his people. Now, this is what I heard just recently. He said he's about to break through or release the anointing of multiplication. And when he does that, what you say will echo and become more powerful. You see the law of multiplication uh, with the, the four leprous men there sitting at the city gates. And they said, you know, while we're sitting here and die, we might as well just get up and let's go to the Syrians and let's see what they're going to do with us. Right. Making a long story short. Well, at twilight, they got up and they went to the camp. And the Bible declares that as they came, the Syrians heard like they thought it was an army that they thought the people of God had hired other kingdoms to come and destroy them. They heard the sound of many chariots and many foot soldiers coming. But it was actually only those four men. God multiplied their sound in the ears of the enemy army and they all ran off and they left everything. So the Lord's going to say in his saying there will be, there will come a time when he will say do what you've been doing but do it right here. For you it would seem as though you're doing the same thing. Nothing has changed. Why am I having so much impact? Why uh, why is this ha why am I seeing so much change? I'm doing the same thing. He will say do it but do it in this job or do it in this position. Or just say it over here or say it over there. It's just like a person that um, just talks. You're just talking. You're just saying the same words that God has given to you. But now the Lord says, put this microphone in your hand. You're saying the same words. You're the same person. But now he takes your voice and he amplifies it. He takes your ministry and he amplifies it. He takes your impact, your impact, and he amplifies it. And so he's getting his church ready for this great amplification because the world would need to know Christ. The world would need to know who Jesus really is, who the real church is. There's so much fake. There's so much phony. So he will rise up. He's rising up the real, those who really know him, and he's going to amplify their voice, amplify their gifts, amplify their ministry. And you're doing the same thing that you were doing, but now it's having a greater impact. Let those that have an ear hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. He's impacting. You will have a greater impact. Now, before he does this or as he does this, he's making sure that you and I know how to handle temptation. And you and I know how to handle sin. How to overcome. Because sin and temptation has robbed a many of their ministries, of their marriages, of their money, of their businesses. This is a deadly thing. It's quite deadly. And it is very destructive. So the Lord said, I will empower you to overcome it. So that when your voice is amplified, you won't be an embarrassment. There's one thing for someone to struggle and you only have five people in the church. But when you're struggling with the same thing and now there's 50,000. Your voice has a greater impact. Greater impact. So before he puts you here, he's got to make sure a few things are settled within you. So don't forsake this time. 
because you are people of influence. Someone is watching you. Some ones are watching you. Multiples are watching you. They're watching your lifestyle, hearing your words, because you know the God of the universe personally. And they still thinking that the universe will help me. They still think that, well, there's something out there. I'm not sure what it is. They haven't identified yet. But when you say, I know the creator, I know Jesus. Let me show you what he's like. When you give him a rating, a review. Because they have no idea who he is. But you do. And they'll see him through your lifestyle. He'll, they will hear him through your words. So don't take your life, what you do, your public ministry, your private ministry, don't take it for granted because someone is watching. You are being prepared for open ministry. What you do privately, what you do privately at home late at night or in the daytime, what you do by yourself will be shouted out, shouted out on the rooftops. That day is coming. You must be ready for your revealing. When David was about to be anointed king, and you know this very well, he did not have time to go back and prepare. The prophet Samuel was sent to uh, David's house, you know, Jesse's house. J Jesse was David's father. God told Samuel, need you go to Jesse's house. There's a king there that's going to replace Saul. So Jesse had all of his sons come except for David. They all knew that Samuel was coming. And so they all took their baths. They all put on their best clothes. They all changed. They all had their smell good on waiting for the prophet to come for the king anointed the king, um, the one who would anoint them king to come waiting for Samuel. Well, one by one, Samuel, the prophet Samuel said, this is not it. This is not it. This is not the son. None of these. Do you have any other children? He says, yes, I got one more boy. He's out there with the sheep. They say, well, we're not going to sit down until he gets here. David's called in out the field. He didn't have time to bathe. He didn't have time to change his clothes. They were all sitting there waiting on him. He came in smelling like sheep. He came in dirty. He came in appearing unprepared. You won't have time to prepare once God calls you. The time of your appearance is approaching. And so the Lord prepares you now. And what David did working with the sheep is what he did with the entire kingdom. Keeping God's people. Keeping God's sheep. Are you hearing? You must be ready for this shift, for this time of multiplication. When your name will be spoken in the mouths of people that you don't even know. You must be ready for that time of multiplication. And once you step on that platform, once you step in that place, it's too late to be fooling with sin and temptation, not knowing how to overcome it. Because in that place, not only if you fall in that place, will you affect you, you'll affect many, affect many others. You don't want your name associated with someone that says, I thought Jesus wasn't about nothing. That's what I, oh, they're, they're all the same. Will your name be added to that list? You be one ones added to that list of another fake, another phony. Oh, they talked a good talk, but, but look, look at the evidence. No. What's done in private will be shouted out on the rooftop. Better to be a private success. A private success makes you a public success. But if you are only successful publicly, but not successful privately, what you do in the dark will, will tear down what people think about you in public. Have we seen many celebrities that have gone that way? This is a time of revealing and it's coming 
the time of multiplication. God is preparing you for your time of revealing. What is the Lord saying from heaven right now? God is preparing you for your time of revealing. What is God saying? I wonder what is God saying right now to me in the church today. He is preparing you for your time of revealing. You're being prepared for your time of revealing. So don't forsake this time. Now notice here in what happens in, in Matthew, this seven chapter, Matthew seven. I know it's heavy, but it is truth and you must be ready. Look at Matthew 7, Matthew 7, look at verse 24 through 27, very familiar text of scripture. Hear this, Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27 says this, anyone who listens, talking about Jesus, Jesus is speaking here, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on, on solid rock. Though the rain comes, say comes, Say so comes, though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it wouldn't collapse because it was built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teachings, my teaching and doesn't obey it is what? It's foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods, what, come, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Well, the Lord is making reference also to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 10.25. Listen to what Proverbs 10.25 says. He says, when the storms of life, what, come. When the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away, but the godly have a lasting foundation. I want you to notice something. There is a temptation to only hear the word, but don't do it. Those who have a form of godliness or act religious, they'll hear it but won't do it. You notice both he who, person who, both people that heard the word were able to build a house because God's word is power. I say it again, God's word is power. If you sit under the word of God, if you hear the word of God daily, if you, if you read your Bible or, or have it playing in your house and just have the word around you, God's word is power. Pure power. And both these individuals, the religious, the one that had a the ones that act religious or one that had a form of godliness and the ones who actually did the real actually did it. They both built a house because God's word is power. But the one that actually did it built it on a foundation. Both build their houses, they both build their lives, they both build their careers, they both build their ministry, they both build their marriages, they both build their finances. But when the storms come, the storms come to test your foundation. And foundation has to do with your trust in God, your trust in his word. When the enemy comes because he is coming, when he comes, he's coming for two reasons. One, he wants to... Uh, he wants to destroy your confidence in God, in his character, and destroy your confidence in his word. He's coming after your relationship with him to get you to turn your back on him and to realize or to say that God's word is fake. It doesn't, it's not real, it's not true. The enemy comes, the storm comes, Satan comes for your foundation. Not the house. Because the house will be destroyed if you don't have the foundation. He comes for your foundation. Do, are you really trusting in God? Are you really trusting in his word and the presence, uh, rather the person of his character? He's coming for the foundation. Satan comes. He's very mobile. And many times he comes uh, seasonally. 
Once you notice this, so the enemy comes seasonally. Now, let's look at uh, Luke 4, Luke 4, 13. We were here on last week. I want you to, oh, one of the weeks, I want you to see this again. Luke 4, verse 13 says this. The, and, and when the devil uh, had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a what? For a season. He departed from Jesus for a season, meaning I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. The enemy's trials in your life are seasonal, are seasonal. Now, something, sometimes stuff will happen. And it's just a part of life. You can't avoid it, just a part of life. But then there are other things, other storms that will come your way because it's, it's demonic in nature, testing a trial in nature, and Satan's after you. But his trials are only seasonal. Are you hearing me? But he will come. And when he comes, you must be ready. Look at John, John, look at John 14, verse 30. John 14, verse 30 says this. Hereafter, the Lord Jesus speaking to the disciples. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world, what? Cometh. And hath nothing in me. Listen to that same verse out of the Amplified Bible. It says, I will not talk with you much more. For the prince, the evil genius, ruler of this world is coming. And he has no claim on me. Here's the preparation I need you to get. He has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. And he has no power over me. Notice the testimony of Jesus. Remember, when you arise, when God puts you there in your next level, when he puts you there on that platform and the anointing of multiplication is going forth in your life. I mean, it's going forth. You're doing the same thing, but it's having a greater impact as if you're speaking over a microphone in a coliseum. You're saying the same words you said back in the back in the place where you have five people with you the same words you said in your bedroom the same words you said on your YouTube or on your Facebook the same thing you've been saying the same thing but now God is multiplying it and now that he's multiplying it's making the enemy notice oh you're trying to tear down my stuff it's making him notice he comes but when he comes, we must have these things in place. Notice what the Lord Jesus says again. He says, he has no claim on me. The devil has no claim on me. He says, he has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. And last, he has no power over me. If you have something that belongs to to somebody else in your house. Let's say it that way. Let's say you got my stereo system. No, 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 no. Let's say you got my PlayStation 5 at your house. And you know it's mine. You know it's mine. I know it's mine. And because it's in your house, you're giving me access to come in your house and get my stuff. If you won't let me in your house, I'll bring the authorities with me to come in and get my stuff from your house. Because you have something that belongs to me. Right? Here's the problem. We're trying to say, devil, get out, get away from me. But he say, you got my PlayStation. You got my this and you got my that up in your house. Why does the devil keep messing with me? Why does he keep coming back in my life? You got something that belongs to him. And so we give him legal right to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. And he brings more of his friends, keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back because there's something of his that you have. So Jesus says again, he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There's nothing in me that looks like him. Nothing. He says, 
Uh, he has nothing come with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He says he has no power over me. That is your final state. The devil got no power, no control in your life. No control in my life. You are you're like a nuclear bomb. Several billion nuclear bombs. And you don't want the devil to have your launch codes. Because he knows when you go off, folk going to get hurt. Are you hearing? You don't want him to have any control over your life. None whatsoever. We're going to get back to that. Look at Job, Job 2 and verse 2. The Lord asked the devil a question. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, going to and going, um, going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. What you doing? Looking for somebody to destroy. He's very mobile, always looking for a way in. Let me give you another picture. If we were in the building, if you were in your house, and if you knew that there was one of those big old anaconda snakes, you know, the ones that are real big, big as a car. And you know, that thing was just circling around your house, waiting, trying to find a way to get in. Yeah, Tamara said it's time to move. You know, that thing was all around. It is. It's just circling your house, trying to find a way to get in. And you know you're checking on your doors, you're checking on your windows, because you know if it finds a spot to get in, it's going to come in. It's going to devour. That's the same thing the devil does. He's circling. He's circling. That's what he did with Job. He circled Job's house, circled Job's house. And the only thing that really kept Satan out of Job's house because Jacob, uh, because Job was a worshiper. Now, his motives for worship was a thing that attracted the devil to him in the first place because Job worshiped out of fear. I'm going to lift up this offering before the Lord because maybe my children have sinned. Maybe my children have cursed God. Maybe my children have cursed God. So he kept up a worship barrier. He kept up a barrier of blood always before the Lord. So the devil couldn't get in because Job was a worshiper. But what attracted him to Job was Job's fear. Just like blood and water with a shark. Ooh. Some of you remember that with Find a Nemo. Mm. And Bruce smelled that blood in the water. Oh, my. Fear is very attractive to the enemy. And so although the enemy could not again, because Job was a worshiper, he was always offering blood before the father on behalf of his children, always offering blood. There was a blood shield all around Job. But the enemy was always circling. Always circling, always circling, waiting for a door. So God said, where are you going? Where are you coming from, devil? Oh, I'm just walking around. I'm just walking around. He said, have you considered my, ser my servant Job? Yeah, of course I have. But you got this thing around him. I can't get him. He said, all right, let's, let's, let's do something. You know, the case that goes on further. Look at John 10, 10. You know this very well. John 10, 10 says what? The thief does what? The thief cometh not but to what? Steal and to what? Kill and to what? Destroy. But Jesus said, I am come. Jesus is also coming. Also circling, waiting for a way to get in. Knocking at the door of your heart. Also looking for a way to get in. A devil's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to break in to bring you destruction, but Jesus wants to come in just to give you life and give you life more abundantly. Let's look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. I want you to see this. I want you to see this because it's very easy for us to take this thing lightly. I want you to know, I don't want you to be afraid, but I want you to know what's really going on because God is about to amplify your reach, amplify your voice, amplify your ministry. 
He's amplifying it. You have to be ready. First Peter five verses eight, nine. There's a reason why you got the new job. There's a reason why many of you have moved to other places, uh, whether the job or whether it's to a home. There is a reason why. There's a reason why we got the promotion. There is a reason why. You got to be ready for it. First Peter five. Verse 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. He's mobile, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The enemy wants control. He's going to devour through Control. Hear me, child of God. He's going to try to devour your life through control. It's not just good enough that he has someone else to come in and do something. His greatest defeat, his greatest weapon against you is when you say something to destroy others. It's when you pick it up and you destroy your own self. He wants to break in. And then influence you so that you cut the fool and your marriage is over. You cut the fool on the job and you get fired. He wants to influence you so that you say something to your best friend and then they don't say anything to you anymore. They don't speak to you anymore. You did it. And then he stands back and he laughs. He stands back and he laughs. Not only has he destroyed not only has he destroyed them, but he's, he's also dealt with you, and now you're filled with guilt and shame and all these things about something you did. You caused the destruction of that. You let him in, and he took control. We said this, let's go, let's go here again. In Genesis 4, verse 7, let's see this again. The father talking to Cain, he said, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door. What? Eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. It's always eager to control like a serpent trying to get in the house. Just wants to control. Just wants to put it in your hands. Just wants you to do it. Look at Ephesians, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, verses 25 and 26, or rather, and 27. I want you to see this. You say, I don't know about that. Well, I want, you, I want you to know about this. Ephesians 4, verse 25, 26, 27 says this. And some of you, this is a word right now. So stop telling lies. Yeah, straight from the Bible there. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. He's not talking to the world, by the way. He's talking to the church. He said we're all part of the same body. Verse 26, and don't, and don't sin by letting anger what? Control. How many of you realize that anger will control? Don't sin by letting anger control control you don't let it in how many, i wonder how many of you have ever said something that you regretted while you were angry done something you shouldn't have done while you were angry the enemy circling 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 trying to get in let's finish reading here it says don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Foothold, King James says, it gives him place. It gives him access. It gives him an open door against you. When someone says, I don't know why I lost my temper. When you lose your temper, guess who finds it? That devil finds your temper. Your temperament, your control, temper, your temperament, your control. He finds it and he uses it against you. Hear me. Many of you are about to be tempted by at your very foundation. And some is going to catch you unaware. 
and it's going to pop up. And you're going to think about this time. I pray that at that moment, during that time of temptation, that you will realize that you don't have to go to it. You don't have to go through this. You can repent at that moment. Give access of your soul back to God. Close that door for the enemy and move forward. Now, when you say no to temptation, it's painful. It will always be painful to you. It will be painful when you uh, give in to temptation. It may feel good at the moment, but I guarantee you it's painful later. But as equally, it is painful when you say no. When you see that good, that good piece of chocolate cake sitting over there. When you say, no, I'm not going to eat that chocolate cake. That's a measure of pain right there. Because you really want it. When you really want to look at this or that, or when you really want to think bad thoughts and you tell yourself, no, every time you tell yourself, no, it's pain. Because we don't like the word no. It's pain. It's either you're going to have pain now with glory later. Or you'll escape pain now only to have very destructive pain later. But God's pain, when we say no to temptation, that's building something in you. It's like a weightlifter in the gym. They say, what, no pain, no, no gain. It's painful. And you go, oh, but it's building something in you. It's productive pain. Every time you resist the enemy, it's productive pain because you really want to go along with him. But when you say no, it becomes productive pain for you. Let's finish off today because I really want to show you some other things too. When the enemy comes and he seeks to control your life, he can't just jump in. Again, there has to be something of his that belongs to him in you, around you. For you to think about murdering somebody or hating somebody that there, there has to be some form of that, some form of dislike already in your heart against them. He has to have something to work with. The enemy will never succeed trying to make you do something that's not in you. The building blocks of it must already be there. Some part of you already wants to do it. That's a fault that's a weakness in the wall. He finds the weakness in the wall. And he comes in, he tries to manipulate the weakness. And he does that through other thoughts, through whisperings, trying to convince you that that really, you know, hey, you know, they really deserve that. You know, you ought to go ahead and just do that. You were already thinking it. It was down low, but you were already thinking it. Why are people's words, and we begin to close with this, there's so much more. Why are people's words so painful to us? Why are they so painful to us? They are painful because we already believe it on some level. They say, you are so, you are so skinny or, or you are so wide or, or you are, you know, you are this and you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're really, you're really stupid. Why are those words so hurting? Why do they cut so much? Because on some level you actually believe it. And those words have a landing place in your heart because on some level you're already thinking it about yourself. If someone told you, you look just like a Reebok tennis shoe. You say, what in the? Those words are automatically rejected. And you look at them like they're, you're a foolish person. What's wrong with you? They're automatically rejected. You know you don't look like a Reebok tennis shoe. 
They're automatically, you were automatically returned to sender. You don't think about it. You don't give it a second thought. Something is wrong with you. You consider them and not yourself. But when you're already thinking, well, I didn't. Maybe you are right about me. When, they, when you're already thinking, somewhere down in there, you're already struggling with this. Somewhere of insecurity, doubt, already there. It's already a weak spot in you. And somebody else says it, they affirm it, it lands, and it grows like a seed. And it begins to hurt. The thing is, we got to repent from thinking that we are less than. So that when the enemy comes, his words will have no place in us. So when they say to you, you are stupid, it sounds exactly like they're saying you are a Reebok tennis shoe. It's exactly like what? You're never going to make it. They're saying, you are a Reebok tennis shoe. What in the world? What, what do you mean I won't get this job? What do you mean I'm not healed? What, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Those words have no place to land in you, nothing in you. This is why you get into the word of God. This is why you learn the word of God. This is why you meditate on the word of God so that the enemy's words will have no place to land in you so that there's no crack in your wall, no weakness in your wall because he is circling, circling like a serpent, circling like a roaring lion, circling, circling, trying to find a weakness, trying to, trying to get in. That's why you got to meditate in the word. But, but oftentimes we forsake the time of the word. That's a whole lot of other stuff we got to do, and we don't study, we don't get the word of God in us, we don't listen to the word, we don't allow the word to change us, maybe one hour a week. But the rest of the time, that weakness is there. We had to get that out and get his mind in. Get his mind in. There's more for us to go through today. But Father, we just give you this time, and Lord, I just pray that your people have heard your voice. I pray, Father, that we will be ready for that time of amplification, that time of great multiplication when you will multiply our impact. Lord, I pray that in the time of testing and temptation, that our foundation will stand strong, stand true, that we will not be hearers of the word only, but we will be doers of that word. That we would not be whisked away, a world away, but Lord, that we would stand. And when the storm is over, we're still standing. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us. Thank you, Lord, for multiplying our impact. Thank you, Lord, that we will stand on that evil day. I ask, Father, that you continue to deal with your people. Thank you for loving them. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends that are joining us right now from all around the world, if you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, today is your day to do that. The Bible says plainly that you should repent of your sins and believe the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That God is willing right now and really already has forgiven your sins. You just have to receive it. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Lord will save you. And that can start today. Amen. We'll see you next time. God bless you.